Let's do the uh, fleet tracker now. We're going to talk about where the fleets are deployed this week. And it looks like we have uh, the Macon Island out off the coast of San Diego, maybe doing some workup work there. Uh, Harry S. Truman uh, doing some work up on the East Coast as well. So potentially two fleets in the future are going to be uh, deploying from there. The Essex uh, Amphibious Ready Group is in the Persian Gulf. The Carl Vinson's doing something very interesting in the Bay of Bengal. We will get to that. We even have a story on that specifically if uh, we don't get into too much detail on this. And then finally, the Ronald Reagan uh, has finally pulled into Japan. Yeah, they've been at sea forever. I'm sure those sailors are exhausted. So uh, this comes from our good friends at USNI News. That's the United States Naval Institute. Uh, I recommend uh, you, you check it out. You can become a member for free. This is not a paid promotion or nothing. I just, I support the Naval Institute. And uh, if you're interested in Navy things like I am, it's a great source and they're good people. A lot of retired, everybody's here. You name it, chiefs, admirals, and uh, it's fun. So join uh, USNI. Okay, 19, 294 ships. A uh, hundred of them are underway at the moment. So about a one third ratio. It's kind of what we do here. Check out this absolute stud. <laughs> this is a sailor from the Ronald Reagan finally pulling into port after months and months at sea. And he's had enough of your shit. So <laughs> I love this man's expression. He's clearly exhausted, but do you know what's really funny? He is a religious services petty officer. He's the man you go to when you've had a bad day. <laughs> Oh my God. So can you imagine going to this guy <laughs> saying, Hey man, I can't take it anymore. And he gives you that look. He's like, put your shit back together and get back on watch. Motherfucker. <laughs> That's what this guy's going to tell you. Religious services, petty officer, uh, more badass than anybody else on the crew. I got to give him credit. Who's his name? Uh, Austin Bullock. Do not fuck with him. But Hey, if you need some, uh, Jesus in, he'll, he'll give you the Jesus, but then he's going to send your ass back to work. <laughs> oh my god so here we go yeah the families are welcome everybody i love these days the days that you pull in and the families are on the pier always feel so good yeah i never got to really experience that too much uh but i people around me the joy is just immense so these guys are finally pulling in uh carrier uh, air wing five with them with the marine corps uh, air station wing out of japan as well a lot of sailors finally getting some time on shore after a very long deployment so big tip of the hat to all these guys we've been covering these guys for months as they go through and look at this guy he still has his name in his hat oh that's that's a proper sailor right there yeah i bet you they had a uniform inspection and that's one of the requirements you have to have a stenciled name on the inside of your white hat look at that oh my gosh how old is that child I bet you she was born while he was underway. This might be the first time he's seeing his daughter. Holy smokes. This is a gas turbine specialist technician, third class, Daryl McGee, um, assigned to the Halsey. So he's coming off the destroyer, reunites with his wife and meets his daughter for the first time. Look at this. Yes, dude. That's really hard whenever you have children born and you're underway. And all you want to do is after you know that everyone's okay, is just go see them. So, man, they're going to have... What a night at home after that. Very good to see him back in port. You know, whenever you start covering these guys every week, um, we don't really don't get to know them, but we watch what they go through uh, week in and week out here. And they've been through the ringer, the Halsey, the Ronald Reagan, all of them. Okay, let's go to the Bay of Bengal. This is where the Carl Vinson is, and uh, he's doing some ops with the Queen E. Uh, let's take a look at the Queen E. The Queen E's been at sea now for four or five months, and she's still looking okay. A few rust spots. But uh, holding up, I'm really impressed with this employment. I know I say this all the time, but I don't remember the last time uh, the UK deployed for this long in the Pacific. And I know they're in the Indian Ocean now, but still uh, halfway around the globe is my point. Uh, I think UK is back as a naval power. Uh, that had really been in question in like the 90s and maybe the early 2000s too. Uh, but no, they're definitely back and uh, super impressed with the longevity, the endurance of the uh, UK sailors. Hats off to them too. Okay, from the piece, let's read uh, the Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is in the Bay of Bengal after completing its second phase of the Marlboro exercise uh, between US, Australia, Japan, and India last week. This is called the MPX 2021 for short. So that's what I'll be calling it in the future. Uh, Chief of Naval, Op Naval Operations Admiral Mike Gildy hosted 12 senior Indian Naval officers on board the USS Carl Vinson on October 14th during the exercise 
This exercise was first conducted in 1992. So we've been working with these uh, navies since for many, many years. Uh, Carl Vinson uh, Carrier Strike Group deployed on August 2nd. Uh, the U.S. 7th Fleet, it's operating in the U.S. 7th Fleet. The first U.S. Navy deployment with the F-35C Lightning II, a Joint Strike Fighter. Very cool. Look at these F-18s. Oh, man. Looking good. What are these little humps? Hey, somebody that knows about the F-18 Super Hornet, tell me what these are. I bet you that's CCM. I bet you that's a jamming. But look at this. He's got a little targeting pod down here. I want to know what these humps are. Someone find out. Okay. Um, Carrier Air Wing uh, 2 is with them. Uh, we've gone over these guys before, the Argonauts, the Bounty Hunters, the Stingers, and so forth. A lot of you know, aviation personnel with them. Okay, what about cruisers? Lake Champlain is with them. I don't think they've given us a complete list of all the cruisers that are with the Carl Vincent. Uh, let's see, the Arleigh Burke Guided Missile Cruiser USS Sullivan's is with the uh, Richmond class HMS Richmond. That's F-239. And a Ticonderoga class cruiser. Oh, here it is. Yeah, right there. Okay, this is the next ship brief right here, guys. November 1st. You guys are going to be well-educated about how this ship and every system on board works. I may even teach you how to put out a fire on it after, uh, to, after today's news. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here, here's the list of uh, destroyers that are with um, the Carl Vinson, the Dewey, the O'Kane, Michael Murphy, the Chafee, and the Stockdale. Think of each one of these as a battleship because they carry a ton of weapons and capability. And so there's a lot of firepower at sea right now with them. Uh, what's going on here? Navy Air Crewman Mechanical Second Class James Skelly Wright, a native of Greenfield, Indiana, assigned to the Titans of the Fleet Logistic Multi-Mission Squadron, VRM-30, briefs sailors assigned to the UK Royal Navy Aircraft Carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth. Oh, so these are uh, these are UK sailors. Look at a bunch of British boys. Every one of them looks like John Bloor. What the fuck? It's like a boy band, K-pop. That's what this is. Okay. Anyway, the UK uh, Royal Navy Strike Group, uh, led by the HMS Queen Elizabeth, entered the Bay of Bengal on Friday. I wish they wouldn't get that specific, but okay. They're putting it out there, so we are too. This is a cool little picture. Seaman Griffin Rainier and Seaman Jude, oh boy, we'll just call them Seaman Jude, uh, participate in small boat operations on board the amphibious uh, operation uses Essex. <coughs> Essex is one of those amphib uh, ships, similar to the one that we just talked about burning down. So these guys got to pick up the slack. Okay, uh, the ARG is comprised of three ships, <clears throat> the USS Essex, the USS Portland, and the USS Pearl Harbor. We'll be saying these names a lot over the next few months because we're following their, their, their deployment. <clears throat> and then in the Western Atlantic, who's this? Seaman Isaac Lawrence from uh, Idaho stands lookout on the fantail of the Nimitz aircraft carrier. Oh, okay, lookout. He should have some glasses. I think he. I think he's got binoculars right there, but uh, he's taking a break from them, I guess. So who's this? Eastern Pacific. Who's that? Oh, Macon Island. Okay, yeah, Macon Island. LHD eight navigates San Diego Bay after getting underway. Very good. So what are they up to? Uh, the Macon Island is underway in Southern California operating areas. So they're doing something. Whether it's a test or it's a workup to go on deployment, one of those two things is true. Maybe both. <laughs> They're not exclusive. They could be doing both of those. But um, So I kind of like it whenever they leave it vague like this because you know they're doing something interesting that they don't want to share with you. Anyway, so that's where we are in the world. Congratulations on the new baby. That's awesome. All these sellers going home. I absolutely love this dude. <laughs> i got to save this picture. <laughs> I find this hilarious. Uh, I, the, the, the fact that he's a religious service petty officer is what makes it funny, okay? This is the guy you go to when you're feeling down. <laughs> and, and, and then he kicks your ass in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, I love it. I want that job so bad. I should have been that. Oh, that would have been. I could have. It would have been comedy gold. I would still be in the Navy. Oh, my God. I should have been a religious services petty officer. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I digress. I have to get away from that topic. I'm going to laugh myself silly. Okay, yes, and I news. Okay, let's get to something a little more serious, but it's also a little bit of a nothing burger. Oh, but this is a great example. I'm getting way ahead of myself. All right, let's back it up a little bit. We're going to talk about 10 Chinese Russian warships sailing through Japanese islands, okay? 
Uh, this piece from USNI News, written by uh, Dizran Mahadizer. Sorry for screwing up your name, but did my best. And these are the ships here. So we got a couple of uh, Chinese ones over here. This is a Udaloy, Udaloy, and this is a. Um, oh, this is one of those long-range radar ships. This is where they track like ballistic missiles and stuff from space. Uh, here's a couple Russian frigates. That's one of their new frigates. Supply vessels. I think that's Japanese right there. Anyway, so 10 total ships from those two nations working together. We predicted this a few months ago. We were like, man, what happens if China and Russia start teaming up and working together? That'd be a, you know, don't want to mess with either one of those. Because if, if, they, if they sign a defensive pact, it's over. Taiwan is going to be part of China, you know, and it and they're starting to do exercises like this together. This shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, hell, if we can predict this, we know that the experts have already thought of this. But let's get into uh, what they actually did together. These 10 ships sailing around the Sea of Japan. A combination of 10 Russian ships and Chinese People Liberation Army Navy ships sailed from the Sea of Japan to the Pacific Ocean through the Sugara Strait between the Japanese home islands and Honshu. Uh, the Joint, Joint Staff of Japan Self-Defense Force said in a press statement. Uh, the Japanese Maritime Defense Force spotted the ships at, on Monday in waters 70 miles south of uh, Okushiri Island in Hok Hokkaido. Man, I'm messing up all these names. Uh, the ships sailed east through the strait to the Pacific Ocean, where presumably they are now. Uh, the release noted that it was the first time the naval vessels from both countries had sailed jointly through the strait. Uh, the joint staff release identified the ships, and they name all of them here. You can read the piece if you want to know all the different names. Uh, uh, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force monitored the passage via P-3 Orions, which are maritime aircraft, uh, from the Fleet Air Wing 2 stationed at the airbase in Japan. Very good. Okay, the Sugaru Strait is an international waterway that allows foreign vessels to transit it. The narrowest point is 12.1 miles. Japanese territorial waters are only extended into three miles uh, uh, of the strait. Uh, in, in the strait, contrast to the in internationally adopted 12 nautical mile limit. So here's a great example of... Obviously, if they claimed 12 miles, they would basically claim the whole strait. And then you would need like, you know, either a shipping lane, which would allow for constant shipping, or you would need special permission from the host nation to go through their waters. And J J Japan, just being a good neighbor to surrounding areas, recognizes this choke point is very narrow and says, OK, we're just claiming three miles. That leaves plenty of room for everybody to get through. And this is the example that I think other nations should follow. And I'm looking at you, China and Russia, when you start bitching about other ships operating in what's clearly international waters, 70 nautical miles away from anything important, you know, you don't go racing out there and saying, hey, we kicked the Americans out because uh, in choke points like this, the only way to get from one end to the other is to get close to land, you know? And so Japan did the right thing by only claiming three nautical miles, which they've done historically. And then they don't make a big deal about this. Notice how there's no protest. Yeah, that's that's the way common nations, that's the way the laws of the sea are written and everyone observes it, except China, North Korea, Russia, you know, the countries that bitch all the time about American vessels around the globe doing nothing but sailing in international waters is ridiculous. It needs to stop, really. It unnecessarily raises tensions. So be more like Japan is my point. All right, let's go back to the piece and see if there's anything else interesting here. Like I said, it's a bit of a nothing burger. Some ships went to sea. Maybe they wanted to get their name in the papers. I don't know. Uh, it says, previously, PLAN ships took part in the Sea Interaction 2021 exercise between the two countries from October 14th to 17th, three-day naval exercise. The Russian defense minister released Monday announcing uh, the completion of the exercise mentioned the PLAN contingent as also includes a rescue ship. Oh, that's what that big ship was. Okay. And a diesel submarine was with them as well. The uh, Oost Bolshertisk. Anyway, uh, B-494. Is that a kilo? It might be a kilo. I'm not sure what class that is. Somebody can look up B-494 for us, please. Okay, back to the piece. Uh, the release emphasized that the joint naval drills have been regular, have been a regular occurrence since 2012. 
that no exercise was held in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, exercise has raised speculation uh, that the two countries trying to counterbalance the intense number of exercises in the region conducted by the Quad, a partnership of United States, Japan, India, and Australia, and various multilateral exercises. That's true. There's been a lot of naval exercises in the Pacific this year. Yep. USS Chafee was conducting a routine operation in the Sea of Japan when Russian Utiloy destroyer Admiral Tribbets approached. We covered this on Monday, and this was the example I was talking about. There's no need for the Admiral Tribbets to approach and try to make a big deal about the USS Chafee sailing around. Um, but yet they did. And it just, it really, in my opinion, it makes them look dumb. It really does. Um, and that's really it. So these are the ships. You guys have anything to add? Did anybody look that up? It was a kilo. Thank you. Yeah. I thought it was. P. Pistol says, are the Russians and the Chinese at least likely to be pointing their weapons at each other as they are to be pointing? Yeah, they do have a long history of not necessarily getting along. Um, there is a really good uh, report. I, it's one of my sub briefs where I talk about how China and Russia, uh, they they started out being pretty tight in like 1949, 1950. And then slowly that um, relationship just de degraded. And there's even a name for it. Like it's famous, the separation, because they went down two different routes of communism. There was the Maoist type and there was the Stalinist type. And, you know, they don't they don't mix well together. And so their relations are not as strong as they used to be. That's true. Sino-Soviet border conflict. Yes, that was part of it, too. Yeah, the Sino-Soviet split. That's what they called the splitting of their ideologies. Yeah. Anyway, it's a really interesting topic. If you want to Google that, you can go down a rabbit hole on YouTube with it. I recommend it. All right, let's keep going. Like I said, we got a lot of stories to cover today. We're not in a rush, but um, there's not a lot more to say about that. Ten ships sailed together. Yay. Okay, new European attack submarine programs push limits of diesel technology. This is really cool. And we did talk about this a couple weeks ago, but this is an update by Tim Fish writing for uh, USNI News. Uh, the new diesel electric attack submarine SSK programs for NATO members, Italy, Norway, and Germany. So now we're adding Italy to the mix now. Whenever we first talked about this, it was just Norway and Germany are indicative of developing trends in the uh, conventional submarine market for stealthier attack boats. These countries are developing a type 212 SK designed for their navies. It's called the 212 CD common design. And it's the latest and greatest of all the uh, German really technology uh, building a really good sub that's coming. Italy is using it to enhance its domestic SSK manufacturing capability, while the Norwegian German program is piloting its first ever joint SSK construction program uh, through its initial stages. Okay, so it, it, Italy is doing its own thing, but it's taking advantage of uh, this new technology that they're implementing into the Type 212 CD. Italy's near future submarine or NFS programs begins this month with the construction of its first U-212 NFS, near future submarine is what NFS stands for. Holland signifies the first step towards the eventual return of Italy to the SSK market. I wonder if that is implying that they may sell these. Hmm. Okay, the export market of SSKs has been dominated by France and Germany and their shipyards. Naval Group uh, Thyssen Corp Marine Systems, or TKMS, successfully uh, selling their designs overseas. The second tier of suppliers includes South Korea, Sweden, and Russia, uh, which all secured significant contracts. So that's what Italy's looking to do, I bet, is uh, this whole Finicantieri is going to be uh, to preparing to deliver four of the near-future submarine boats to the Italian Navy uh, that are a modification to the existing Type 212. Yeah, it'll be interesting whenever this design is made public, how similar it is to the 212 common design that's going to Norway. And I bet you they share a lot of the same features. We'll, we'll know when that comes out. <clears throat> Unlike the US 212A submarines, all engineering will be developed uh, by the Finicantieri uh, combat systems will be Italian led. So this will be a 100% indigenous, which is what every country wants. They wanna make their own weapons so that if they ever go to war, you know, you don't want to go to war with the country that's supplying you parts for your submarines, right? So you want to make everything yourself so that that leaves your options open if you ever have to go to war. Yeah. All right. The final design will be a critical design review in June 2022. Uh, the launch of the first NFS is expected in 2026 with delivery date 2027. Second boat will fall on. So this is a reasonable time frame going back to the attack boat. 
that debacle. So Italy is designing right now a new submarine. The critical design review is going to happen in June of next year. And then they're going to lay steel um, the launch. So the steel laying would happen somewhere between 2022 and 2026. They don't really say when, but it's going to be launched in 2026. So this all happening within a five or six year period is a reasonable design to construction time for a conventionally powered submarine. So take that. Uh, the first pair of boats will be will replace Italian Navy's uh, 1980s vintage Sorrow class batch three. They're still running those. Huh? Yeah, these are very old subs. They need to be retired before somebody gets hurt because the old subs aren't just noisy. They begin to leak and that can lead to a disaster, as we saw in Indonesia earlier this year when a very experienced crew took out, you know, a reasonably old submarine. It wasn't that old and they were never heard from again. So presumably they they flooded out as well. Uh, what else do we want to read? Elsewhere in Europe, the Type 212 program is breaking boundaries. Norway and Germany are embarking on the first joint construction of the SSK uh, between countries with the new Type 212 CD variant in their navies. The Royal Norwegian Navy uh, will receive four boats and the Federal German Navy will only receive two. I wonder why they're only going with two. Probably for cost because these things are not cheap. Like it says here, it's a uh, $6.5 billion program. That's a lot of, is that euros? It's dollars. 5.5 euros, $6.5 billion. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, one interesting story. Thank you, Tim Fish, for writing it. But you need an editor, sir, because you've repeated yourself twice in the story. <laughs> Maybe he's getting paid by the word. I don't know. Um, anyway, I look forward to more uh, stories from Tim here. What do you guys think? This, this, new, uh, this new submarine that Norway's getting is really interesting, but we're so early in the build process, we don't really have anything to look at or even really talk about. But um, I think it's going to be cool. Uh, should they buy these and base the squadron out of Taiwan? You know what? Uh, what is Taiwan doing? Aren't they building their own submarines? I'll need, you know what I'll do? I'll look at that. Uh, I know nothing about the Taiwanese submarine force. I don't even know what kind of submarines they operate. And I should know that. So I'll, I'll take that as a look up chat. Good call. Paid by the word word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go on to the next one. Um, oh, this is, uh, this is interesting. So uh, the Indian Navy got busted again. They're uh, out there doing their submarine thing and they keep getting counter detected by the Pakistanis. Oh, at, at first we thought Pakistan had released old footage because this just happened like last year or maybe a year and a half ago uh, where an Indian submarine was recorded by a Pakistani maritime ASW helicopter, you know, through its infrared or forward looking infrared flare while, while they were snorkeling. And this happened again. Let's zoom in on this. This is a full credit to H.I. Sutton. He writes for Naval News. Um, and he has his own website. He also has his own YouTube channel now. You guys got to subscribe to uh, Covert Shores YouTube channel. He's putting out a lot of really good videos and he's getting better uh, in his production. So I look to see he's going to be a big YouTube channel. He'll probably exceed me at some point. OK, so this is an AIP Calavari class uh, detected off Pakistan. This is the evidence that Pakistan has released. They have the snorkel. They have the optics mast. And the, you can see the clear wake of a submarine going through the water here. And uh, this was taken on October 16th, uh, near midnight, assuming that's local time. That could be Zulu. If it's Zulu, it's not quite midnight. Anyway, got busted. Stop getting detected, India. Jesus. Okay, uh, from the piece, uh, Indian Navy submarine reported in international waters off the coast of Pakistan. This is why it's kind of a nothing story. They weren't really doing anything that they're not supposed to do. It's just a submarine out there recharging its batteries or something, doing some snorkeling, presumably at nighttime, um, which is when they should do it. But they got busted. Okay, a video has surfaced taken by the Pakistani Navy showing the submarine operating at periscope depth. The snorkel and its optotronics mass, like a periscope, are visible. Initial analysis support claims that it is the Indian Navy type. According to reports, the Pakistani Navy Maritime Patrol aircraft observed the submarine on October 16th, 2021. The accompanying video shows two masts of the submarine. Analysis of the footage suggests that it's a Scorpion class submarine. Uh, circumstantially, the supports that claim that it is an Indian naval vessel that operates the Scorpion, uh, known locally as the Calavari class. 
the submarine expert uh, Richard W. Stern. By the way, you should subscribe to him on Twitch on Twitter. Uh, Richard W. Stern, he's really good, who specializes in identifying submarines based on their mast and antennas, also identified it as a Scorpion-class boat. <clears throat> Do we, have, we don't have the video, unfortunately. Uh, based on the coordinates and the overlaid imagery, the submarine was observed approximately 150 nautical miles south of Karachi. <laughs> so it's deep inside international waters. It's not. This is a nothing burger other than they caught themselves a boat. Uh, can we go here? What happens if we go here? This is not the video. Okay. Um, but this gives you an idea how far away from land they were. They weren't near anybody doing anything other than being at sea and recharging, snorkeling, doing something at yeah, periscope depth uh, whenever the uh, Pakistani maritime aircraft came over and detected them. So that's how easy it is to get snapped up. You know, just be careful out there. Uh, there have been a, a series of similar events in recent years. Generally, the exact details are unclear, and it's reported differently by each country. This footage appears to be distinct from previous released imagery. That's what I thought. I thought they were releasing previous because they just done this, like I said, a year ago. But no, apparently this is all new video. Uh, and the annotations in the imagery indicate that it was on October 16th between uh, 2318 and 2336 hours. So really late at night, close to midnight. Uh, it's not clear whether that was local time or universal time known as Zulu, which would be around 0400. So 0400 would make sense because they would want to recharge their batteries fully before the sun comes up. So and typically militaries keep their clocks in Zulu time. Uh, you don't because in the Navy, you're going through time zones all the time. You never have the local time zone. So the way we would do it was we, we would go to Zulu almost every time. But if we were only going out for like a few days off the coast of Connecticut to run some drills. We may stay in Eastern time called Romeo time. Uh, but that was not the standard. The standard was go to Zulu as soon as you can after the dive point. Just to give you guys some insight into the submarine life. All right. Oh, and here's a picture of Mr. H.I. Sutton. Look at that happy little gentleman there. Really good dude. Uh, so definitely give him a follow on YouTube. He's trying to build a YouTube channel now. Uh, he writes, the follow on uh, P751 class are expected to have AIP, air independent power, uh, from the start and will generally be larger and more stealthy. Uh, the Indian Navy's nuclear submarine fleet will not have to snorkel at all. That's true. There are currently four contenders for the P75 uh, I deal or P751. It looks like an I, but I think it should be a one. Anyway. Oh, it's an eye for India. Okay, the P-75 India deal. These uh, French Barracuda type, the South Korean DSME type, the Spanish S-80, which is really good, and the Russian Amor class. Do not get the Russian one. This Amor class is a piece of crap. Um, I know it's new and all that, but even Russia doesn't want it. That's why I guess they're selling it. But it's a really poor design. Don't go with that one. I kind of like the South Korean one, but talking to my... Uh, OSINT friends online, everyone disagrees with me. Everyone says the Spanish S-80 is much better than the than the South Korean design. I got to defer to them because they are like, no kidding, real experts. I'm just some Yahoo on Twitch. Uh, but I, I think the South Korean one, I still think it's better. <laughs> okay, the Pakistani Navy, meanwhile, already operates three AIP-equipped submarines uh, like the Calavari class. These are French design, but are the older Augusta or Agosta halls uh, they are fitted with the mesma drive okay the mesma drive is like air independent propulsion like first generation it's very slow it's very big <laughs> and uh, it basically takes um, you know liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and combines that into energy it's called the mesma so if you didn't have the uh, sterling engine in the 1990s you had the mesma if you wanted an A aip submarine and you know and, and credit to the french for inventing it obviously well, well done to them. What do you guys think about this? They got snapped up. Calavari subs are AIP. Uh, yeah, it says it right here. Where was that in question? Okay, air independent power. Calavari class does not currently have AIP fitted. Oh, wow. How about this? However, there are plans to install it locally and develop uh, the fuel cell AIP. This should be increased. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, okay. I see what happened here. Um, they wanted it to have AIP from the beginning and they even got the Mesma drives. I covered this in the subbrief whenever we did the, the, the Augusta subbrief that covers the S80 as well for Spain talks about the Mesma drive and AIP technology for India. And they got the license. They even got the Mesma drive 
And uh, I think they put it in the Augusta. But this Calavari class, Hull 1, uh, they did not install AIP uh, initially. But it's going to get it. Uh, it's going to have to go back in the shipyard if they want to put it in Hull 1. But the other hulls um, are going to get it as well. But India doesn't talk about that. India, uh, I love them to death. They're very good at talking about how great their equipment is. They love, they're very proud people. And I, I kind of, as an American, I respect that. So are we. And so... But sometimes they uh, talk beyond their means. They're not as uh, their ships and submarines are not as capable as as they're originally intended to be. And I don't know if this was a cost thing or if it was a technological thing. Something happened to this design, and I forget exactly what it was that prevented this AIP from being installed. Yeah, I bet you H.I. Sutton knows. If you go to the H.I. Sutton YouTube page, he probably has a video on it. Yeah. So uh, to the gentleman in chat who says that the Calavari has AIP, uh, you're not wrong. It's just Hall 1 doesn't have it. And I forget why. It was supposed to. It was supposed to have it. Oh, look at this picture. This is badass right here. So this is the MPX 2021 exercise happening right now in the Bay of Bengal. And it's, you know, it's the UK, it's the Americans, the Japanese, the Australians, and I believe the Indians too, uh, all working together, uh, kicking some ass. Oh, there we go. We zoomed in a little bit. Look at that. Snapshot that. All right. How do I close this now? Jane, get me out of this crazy thing. Uh oh, what if we hit the escape key? There we go. All right. So let's talk briefly about this warships from Australia, Japan, UK, and the US join forces for MPX 2021. Uh, naval forces from Australia, Japan joined together for a multilateral maritime partnership exercise or MPX. 2021. We've been doing these for a while. During, oh, oh I should credit, uh, Naval News uh, and the Naval News staff wrote this. So credit to them. Uh, during the multinational exercise for Indo-Pacific navies to include the Royal British Navy, RN, Royal Australian Navy, uh, JMSDF, and the U.S. Navy are engaged in planning, advancing maritime communication operations, anti-submarine warfare, air warfare, and live fire gun exercises. Everyone loves that. This is This is the fun bit right here. Shoot, shoot the guns, uh, replenishment at sea, cross-deck flight operations, and so forth. Uh, MPX is a high-end multi-domain maritime training uh, at its finest. All four participating nations have endured interest in the security and stability as well as being in the Indo-Pacific region, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the uh, Rear Admiral Dan Martin, commander of the Character Strike Group CSG-1 on the uh, Carl Vincent there. A lot of political speak in that. It's funny how the higher up they get in the uh, captain to admiral level, they begin to talk more and more like politicians. Uh, whatever happened to just being a sailor, man? Tell us what's going on. Uh, but the people that uh, maybe talk like that don't necessarily become admirals. That might be a mutually exclusive skill set. All right. The U.S. Navy routinely conducts integrated training operations with its international partners to demonstrate our commitment and investment to the Indo-Pacific region. In addition to preserving rules based international order, there's that term again, in the global maritime commons, the U.S. Navy's unwavering pledge to maritime security in the Indo-Pacific is critical to international trade and commerce. We want our Amazon packages from China. So get them over here. Really cool stuff. Look at this picture. I can't zoom in on that one. Okay. I'm hoping that they have some new, new information for us. Uh, Royal British Navy participants, they list all of those. These are the same destroyers and frigates that have been with the Queenie uh, for the entire deployment, now going on months. Uh, Carry Strike Group 1 provides combat ready force to protect and defend collective maritime interest of U.S. and its regional allies. Collectively, the VIN SG uh, consists of more than 7,000 sailors collectively. That's a lot of personnel on board all these ships. Most of them are on this one. <laughs> on the big old American carrier. Anyway, so I just want to let you guys know that this exercise is happening right now. And uh, hats off to everybody at sea doing those. This is not easy duty. Especially with the Queen E. Like I said, she's been at sea for the longest of, out of all these. What do you guys think? Any last uh, minute statements from the peanut gallery before we move on? Because this, this is the last story of the day. Let's see what you guys have. Oh, three and above basically speak like politicians. I would agree with that. Yeah, it, it happens earlier and earlier. I know for the Navy, I saw the change at the lieutenant commander level. When the, the lieutenants become lieutenant commander, there is a a shift in their behavior. And I don't know if they do it intentionally or if it's just 
because of the weight of the added responsibilities, but they do begin speaking ambiguously so that in case they're wrong, they can bail themselves out. Yeah. 